Hello and welcome everyone to our latest presentation on infection or colonization which we find in our ICUs. Now infection versus colonization is something which has been intriguing us since a long time especially in the ICU when we get cultures which are positive whether to treat them or to think that they are just colonizer is a major complication that we deal with every day. So as quite evident colonization is something which is asymptomatic and doesn't need treatment while infection is something which has a clinical manifestation and definitely should be treated but it is always not very easy to find such a demarcating line between the two. So in this presentation we would like to define the theory of practice the colonization and infection, the relationship between the them, the examples, the role of multi-drug resistant organisms, the role of biomarkers and any possible strategies to guide our clinical decision when we find such scenario. Now COVID-19 per se adds into this complication because infection in COVID-19 as we have covered in previous videos also is quite common. Now the main reason why COVID-19 is associated with this super infections is because of the direct role of the cytokine storm, the extensive use of antimicrobials, high contact procedures like proning the patient, referral from other hospitals, more importantly the use of steroids and immunomodulating agents the impact of virus induced infl intestinal inflammation on invasive infection considering specific etiologies less adherence to infection control and preventive measures especially in a setting of pandemic the high turnover of healthcare workers as we have seen over the last one two years the staffs keep changing the nurses keep changing the environment is very unfriendly for giving proper nursing care now let's see how from colonization how it actually leads into an infection colonization is basically the presence of a microorganism on or in a host with growth and multiplication of the organism however this doesn't affect the host so there is no clinical manifestation there is no immune response so it hardly is something which need to be treated carrier is a person who has a colonization and he harvests this organism without any clinical manifestation but he is definitely a potential source of giving this bacteria or organism to a susceptible person. So the carrier can be an individual who is colonized, infected but asymptomatic. In the incubation period before the disease, a patient who is convalescent from an acute disease. Now the exposure depends on the means of transmission like droplets, environment, direct or indirect contact. So initially the organism gets a foothold. Once there is a foothold, it results in a colonization state or a carrier state. But once this goes deep, that is it gets attached to the epithelium, there is a chance of infection. This can lead to direct cytotoxicity, toxin production, tissue disruption, injury and dissemination. And this can be either symptomatic or asymptomatic. So there is a gradual progression from no exposure till disease process. Colonization is somewhere in between. Now colonization is very common in human beings. The number of bacteria found inside our body is 10 times more than the human cells. So basically our epithelial linings throughout the GI tract, respiratory tract, on the upper respiratory tract, these are filled with bacteria. So these are the various sites with the most common bacteria which are colonizing them. Now colonization is a dynamic concept. There is something called a resident flora. These are something which are present for a long long time in our body. They survive on the skin for more than 24 hours. Skin or epithelial tract. They are not easily removed and to remove them it requires hours of scrubbing the skin, 
complete sterilization is almost impossible but the most important thing is there is no requirement to do so they are of low virulence and they are actually beneficial to our body's defense mechanism so there is no reason to remove them from our skin or epithelium by any aggressive methods however there is something called a transient flora this survives on the skin for less than 24 hours can be easily removed by soap and water it is usually acquired during contact with contaminated areas now the most important thing about them is they have high virulence they're most commonly enterobacteria c pseudomonas acinetobacter in hospitals and healthcare workers these are present in a very high level so that is the reason why the significance of constant hand washing before touching the patients is so very important now the modification of the skin environment by skin changes of these organisms is still poorly understood but more most of the time it is essential to remove these organisms by hand washing to prevent cross infections especially while doing invasive procedures and if they are present in the epithelium they may require antibiotic therapy in susceptible individuals now colonization at the time of covid-19 has increased this is mainly because of the disease progression the use of immunomodulatory agents various organisms have colon been colonized like fungus virus bacteria we have covered individually all these super infections and colonization and how to deal with them however this can result in difficulty in diagnosing when this colonization is actually causing an infection and when to treat it and when not to treat especially in a situation that is the pandemic situation which is going on right now now as we are all aware antibiotic consumption and antimicrobial resistance is very high all over the world this is the, just the diagram coming from europe it shows the high level of consumption even at community level in some countries and obviously there is significantly high consumption at hospital levels now the data will not be much different from india it is expected that we are using antibiotics at a much higher dose and rate than that has been being used in countries like europe now if we look at the data coming from india that is the antibiotic resistance this is just the antibiotic resistance from the klebsiella as you can see the antibiotic resistance is gradually increasing even to the carbapenems it has crossed almost 75% right now even the resistance to the older antibiotics like polymyxins is also on the rise and this is the data as far back as 2017 we still don't know how the covid-19 pandemic has impacted when there has been a gross overuse of antimicrobial agents during this pandemic situation now colonization where could it be from as we have already discussed this is usually coming from healthcare workers this is just a study which again establishes this thing they did a sampling of the hands of the healthcare workers and they found that that there is a significantly high colonization and culture positivity now as you can see doctors are having a significantly higher rate of having culture positivity now once there is a colonization how long this colonization occurs and how long this colonization stays before it turns over into an infection is something which is still not clear but then it does stay for a quite long time as you can see from here it stays for as long as 144 days now this is a significantly large number which means almost 3 to 4 months the organism is staying inside the body even as high as 6 months that organism can stay how can we decolonize is it necessary to decolonize now this in the context of the mdr gram negative carriers is significantly important now what exactly are these mdr gram negative bacilli these are the organisms which are resistant to the third generation cephalosporins carbapenem resistant organisms acinetobacter and pseudomonas however they 
gain further significance because there are very few antibiotics in the pipeline which are going to deal with them. There is a significantly high attributable mortality when these infections occur in patients admitted to the ICU and there is dearth of effective infection control measures against these pathogens. Coming to the context of decolonization, there are very few studies and this review which was published in Clinical Microbiology and Infection by the European Society did not find any study which actually shows any method by which we can do anything for these organisms. So they do not recommend routine decolorization because we still are not sure if at all it is going to help. And the effectiveness and the long term side effects of decolonization of this organism in high risk population needs to be evaluated in RCTs with proper design and sample size calculation which has not been done till now. Now decolonization, there are various methods. One of the most common methods that is being used is the selective digestive decolonization and selective oral decolonization. This has been shown to provide benefit, but this is not something which is easily available. This is being done specifically in selected countries, in selected ICUs, which already have a very low rate of infection and very high level of nursing care. So whether these therapies can be reciprocated in other ICUs is still not known as of now. Now coming to the screening of carriage of CRE in the setting of high endemicity. Since CRE colonization is associated with increased risk of CRE infection, the knowledge of CRE colonization can be relevant not only for infection control but also for antibiotic stewardship. In certain categories of colonized patients who are at high risk of invasive infection, the knowledge of CRE colonization can be relevant to the selection of empirical antibiotic chemotherapy. Now screening of CRE can be done by rectal swabs but the challenges that remain is the turnaround time, the sensitivity and the specificity. The screening tests can be either culture based or nucleic acid amplification technology based or NAT based. But the turnaround time with culture is as high as 48 hours. But with the nucleic acid amplification technology, it can be reduced to as low as one hour. But the technology is not something which is cheap and it is not something which is easily available in all ICUs. So from a clinical point of view, all patients in whom a colonization could present a risk of invasive disease should be screened if the technology is available, especially the NAT. These patients could be the immunocompromised patients, critically ill patients or who are on ventilator who are exposed to major surgeries, ICUs with preferential setting for targeting active screening. Now the bundled approach to containment is screen these high risk patients, cohort these patients and application of contact precautions. Now the predictors of super infection in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Now in, as we all know super infections is very common in COVID-19 patients This is, and the study here shows the if there is an intestinal colonization of CRE the risk of having a super infection is 16 times higher while on use of IL-6 or JAK inhibitors, it increases the risk by five times, uh, invasive ventilation five times. So as we can see over here, the most common and the most highest risk for developing a super infection is the intestinal colonization. Now coming to secondary infections in hospital in ICUs. Now when and how many cases do we finally find who have this colonization and they end up getting a secondary infection? This is a study which was done in the from February to April 2020 in, in a cohort of patients hospitalized with COVID-19. They included 731 patients and they found 68 patients with super infection. Now this was around 8% had BSI, 3% at lower respiratory tract infection. The overall 28 day cumulative mortality was as high as 17% when there was association of this disease. Now most BSI was due to gram positive pathogens, specifically coagulase negative staph. The carbon pattern resistance in ICUs has definitely increased in the COVID-19 pandemic times. As you can see, this was the rates in 2019, which is the blue. And as you can see, the rates of infection have significantly increased that these red lines increased colonization by carbon pattern resistant organisms in COVID-19 situation. This meta-analysis shows that it has been shown that there is a worse outcome if the CRP and the procals are high. However, they are non-specific for inflammation and 
especially crp could be associated with the covid 19 infection itself however if procal is a indicator of an additional super infection is something which is not yet known till now but as of now it has been shown to be of benefit in predicting worse outcome if the levels of procalcs are increasing especially after the patient has been admitted now this is a similar type of a study which looked into distinguishing between colonization and infection using procal and crp and in this they found that if the procal level is increasing then it is associated with worse outcome and it is associated with a secondary infection and in patients who did not have a secondary infection seen over here with the yellow line you can see that the procal levels are low while those who are having a secondary infection the procal levels are high so procal could be especially the procal crp ratio could be one of the important ways of trying to find out whether the patient has a secondary bacterial infection now one important thing that can be done is the fast tracking of the microbiology for that there is a important need for coordination between the clinical team and the microbiology team because the clinical team has to take the appropriate test they have to do a good sample collection and send for direct examination based on the turnaround time of the tests that are being used whether it's a nat based test or a culture based test the report should be done as early as possible so that infection control and prevention measures can be initiated this is a decision flow diagram for starting antimicrobials in covid-19 patients now if the patient has an icu admission and after the icu admission patient develops a septic shock or a focal infiltrate compatible with a bacterial pneumonia on ct scan or x ray if both the things are present then it is always wise to initiate antimicrobial therapy and send appropriate microbiological samples treatment should be based on local guidelines if both of these are not present either the shock is not present or i'm not finding any new infiltrates then it is always wise to wait while still sending the microbiological sample if there is a deterioration in the patient condition as we have already told there is a role of biomarkers and surveillance cultures in finding out appropriate infections a flow diagram in setup of covid-19 or even normal icus for vap if there is a new worsening in the pulmonary infiltrate new fever new purulent sputums increase in tlc count increase in meningitis ventilation decrease oxygenation increase vasopressor requirement so mostly you have to focus primarily on a multiple clinical parameters and some lab parameters if most of them are indicating a infection then do send a respiratory secretion sampling immediately start antibiotics if the patient is hemodynamically unstable and is having a positive clinical sign for infection if no then we have to look for whether patient has any low, if the patient has low chance of hap or a vap then see if there is any new infiltrate if there is no new infiltrate we can wait and then try to find any extra pulmonary source of an infection and reevaluate after 6 to 8 hours however if there is a worsening of the patient condition or if there is a new infiltrate on x-ray which we can find then we have to initiate antibiotics and biomarkers can be again used for de escalation of these antibiotics if you are starting antibiotics it is preferable to give them for maximum 5 to 7 days treatment and colonization of the fungal part here we have to take into account the risk factors if there there are increased chance of host risk factors like diabetes heart failure cardiovascular diseases copd or if the patient has a long time on ventilator icu had received uh, steroids and tocilizumab and jack inhibitors then probably starting a early antifungal in case of deterioration would be preferable however we do we will definitely send the samples if the biomarkers are negative it is always wise to stop the antifungal but if again the biomarkers are coming positive then we must continue the treatment for antifungal so thank you for your patience and check our website for further information